Hello and welcome back to another episode of Supercoach Insider. My name is Ben. And I'm Chris. And I'm Swizz. And thank you for joining us. This is our team by team analysis series. Up we have Collingwood. Um, Collingwood, uh, pretty much as this is going to be as bad as the LA Lakers in overtime, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be absolutely oh. horrific. Oh, you, you didn't. That's still deep. It's so deep. <laughs> <laughs> cut him. Cut, did you, cut did like, you see my comment like that you, like, blew up? I, I literally like got like, I forgot like, I don't know, 60 likes or something on like a Fox Sports thing on Facebook. I'm guessing that you saw that and then decided just to, to, just to stab that knife and twist it. Twist, oh, so good. So bad. Just yeah, get, get, you off your, get you off your game as you get into your Collingwood. Um, before we move on, SC Insider 100, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok as well, all the audio platforms as well. So Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, you name it, popping off. Chris has been posting about a YouTube video a week, so um, get on YouTube as well. Search for a Supercoach Insider. Get in, like his newest video. Chris will give it a plug. Also brought to you by splashvodka.com.au. Absolutely delicious. These boys are on the – I don't even know what they're on. A bit of a, a mixed concoction. I'm on the Chris, Vino tonight, this, but um, I don't know what Swiss is on. You know, I'm on Fijian rum right now, but we've, we've had some fun with some alcohol. Uh, being being Boy, a good must... day, boys. Good day. I feel like – De- like Swizz's like audio levels just it's just coming up here and I like it I like I think that's where it should be all the time from now I'll put on out some new content I soon. I, 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 I don't know what to do with my before. hands I don't know what to do with my hands it was, it was yeah. good it was real good yep so it was good it was good I told you boys the Royal Rumble was on it was a big day me and Nico we had a lot of fun fair enough and I, I Chris, your time by the way just like uh, Lakers was a foul today uh, it was also a block just so you know um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Collingwood. So where do we start? Uh, they finished we fourth don't. last year, which was, uh, above the Lions. Just thought I'd uh, <laughs> start with that one. And, <laughs> uh, 16 wins, six losses and 104.3%, uh, or a, a percentage, which it probably is the biggest problem with them right now. I think that their, the defense was uh, pretty good, but their offense suffered quite substantially. Um, and look, I think everybody, it's well documented what happened with Collingwood last year. Lots of, you know, wins late in games and big comebacks. Um, so very small margins. I think the, it was a record amount of um, games won by under a kick or something like that. Like it was ridiculous. And they blew it away. I think the original was like six in a season. And yeah, they got to nine or ten. So um, yeah, by, by the coach's own submission, they lacked scoring power during the season. So yeah. Um, identified McStay as a key target. And it sounds to me like they worded him up super early, like halfway through the season or maybe even earlier. Um, yep, we want you at the club, blah, blah, blah. Like um, I can see that McRae identified that as a list issue and just went out and started recruiting for it. So, um, yeah, he was on, on packed his bags halfway through the season. Um, so I think that is a good trade. Part of it is the mobility that we add to the forward line because when Cox was forward of the ball, Obviously, it was a bit of a stagnant forward line. Um, he's basically your bailout kick option. Don't get me wrong. I think it, Cox does well when the ball's in the air, but as soon as it hits the ground, it's a complete liability, and that's the biggest issue with uh, with Mason Cox. Now, that having said that, there's no guarantee that McStay comes in and they don't still play Cox, so that's still something to be wary of. Um, but he's a valid uh, second forward target. Ash Johnson was playing a lot, lot in the back end of last year as that second forward target. Does he get games? That's another um, issue of contention there. Um, but another component of the gameplay that was se- severe is cl- the clearance differential. So they were actually 16th in the league in clearance differential. And so to combat that, obviously, they recruited Tom Mitchell. So he's literally come in to help fix that. And having said that, like if you put like Richmond, who's obviously what Colin would try and play like, they're 15th in clearance differential last year. However, the difference between 16th and 15th is massive. Um, so it's almost to the tune of, I think it's 2.3 per game. So it's not like it's a small gap. They're trying to make up quite a large margin to even just get into that big gap of ordinary. Um, and Richmond were actually just at the base of that. Um, so I think Mitchell coming in actually enables to go to play forward. So you actually have two targets moving back into the forward line, McStay and Degoe, uh as a more permanent forward. I think he'll probably play a larger percentage of his time this year uh, forward to center as opposed to on the ball. Um, uh, and I think that you know, having those two targets will improve their offense significantly. So the plan for McRae this year is to score more while trying to maintain their defense. 
So we'll see how they go. But they obviously did have some some decent off-season acquisitions. Um, and to total them out, the incoming they had Ed Allen, who's a number 19 draft pick. He seems to be an absolute gun. Uh, Billy Frampton was traded in from Adelaide. Bobby Hill was traded from Great Western Sydney. Obviously, Dan, Dan McStay, Tommy Mitchell, Joe Richards was the 48 draft pick, and Jacob Ryan, number 28. Um, leaving that quite a few outs. So there's some, some significant stuff here as well. Callum Brown delisted, Tyler Brown delisted, Isaac Chuck de- Chug delisted. Brody Grundy was obviously traded to Melbourne. Ollie Henry went to Geelong. Jack Madgen was delisted. Liam McMahon was delisted. Caleb Poulter was delisted, which I was surprised by. And obviously Jordan Roughhead all retired during the season. So long list of changeovers. And you can't really argue against the fact that it's now McRae's list. He's gone in, he's done his job, he's, he's recruited in players that are going to be his players and they're playing to his style. Um, so for better or for worse, um, it's now his team. Fixture analysis. So they do uh, play twice Adelaide, uh, Brisbane. So oh, yuck. Um, Carlton, two wins there. Um, Essendon, another two. <laughs> Geelong, unfortunately, and Port, which will obviously both be tough. Um, and they're forced... Th- this is where... Unfortunately, the season is going to be rough. They have a rough start to the season. So they play Geelong away, but that's obviously at the G. Um, Port at home. Then they've got Richmond at home and then Brisbane away. So uh, honestly, guys, are there four f- like coin flip games? Like a, and Probably Geelong, I'd say, is a loss. So one loss and three coin flips to start the season. That's rough. Um, so yeah, hopefully they can come out of that on the on the positive side of the ledger, but it's a, it's a rough start. Um, And their last three, again, Geelong at home, Brisbane at home, and then Essen away. So, yeah, they're going to have um, a tough tough start and a tough end. So in the middle, it gets a little bit easier. Uh, They do have the 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 round 14 buy, which is the second last buy round. So that is a one benefit um, because the last buy round is stacked. Um, So it's slightly beneficial having the 14. And they have the equal eighth hardest. So I think that's, what, the 10th easiest? Um, uh, draw. So yeah, uh, look, where do they sit? I think much the same, but I don't think they get all those flips. I don't think that they can necessarily produce the same sort of late game results they did last year. So for me, I think that they're probably more teetering somewhere between eighth, so seventh to tenth, like on the cusp of the eight, but not guaranteed to be in the eight. They would have to knock off some serious firepower in order to guarantee themselves a spot in the finals this year, in my opinion. Um, yeah, you can't bank on Carlton losing, you know, what, Melbourne. What they, would they lose? Melbourne, Brisbane, Collingwood in a, all in a row. You can't bank on things like that happening to knock guys out of the finals and, and jumping in. So, yeah, I'm, um, we'll see how it goes, but I'm not, I'm not overly optimistic. And I think you guys would say the same, right? Like, where do you guys see the pies this year? Swears, I'll start with you. Uh, Bottom four, something like that. Um, I think <laughs> they Slept. definitely regress. It's it's probably somewhere f- like five to ten. I think they should be good enough to still make it, but there's a couple of good teams that could push. So they had so many close wins last year. If things went the wrong way for them next year or this year, um, I think if the five to ten range is probably where they're at. Yeah, I'm probably going more, Chris. Seven to ten for me. Yeah, yeah, seven to ten for me, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just depends on again if they win those crucial matchups. So last year they saw a positive side of the ledger. Uh, everything stacks up really well. And if you lose a close one, everything can kind of go in, in the opposite. So you know, Carlton lost uh, a couple of close ones. Bang, it's the opposite. So instead of them being, um, yeah, in the eight they were out, and I think it's going to be a really close top eight again because it was very close this year. Carlton missed out yeah, by I Whisker. Think gonna... I think. I think well, it's they, close, they, like St. Kilda. Lately, they've well. had to win, what, guaranteed 13 games. And this year with the extra game, does that push to 14 to be in the eight? So you're going to be 14 and 10. Like, that's a serious win column, you know? Like, 14 wins. They don't just come out of nothing. Um, you know, last year we won two games against Melbourne. Like, you know, those, those are the sort of games that I don't know if they can just replicate. Melbourne have got yeah, stronger. I, I think it's those double ups. There, there's the possibility. You could beat Adelaide, Essendon, and Carlton. For six wins, there. I think yeah. if you do that, well, and then but that depends that, what Carlton was. Like, I'm really saying. Like. I'm not saying you can't. Yeah, I'm not saying it will happen, but I'm saying it can happen. And yeah. then that's before you're adding your Norths, Hawthorns, GWSs, those sort of teams, and that. So I can potentially see 
you know, 10 wins already. And it's just, is it just 10 wins or is it pushing, you know, or maybe say it's 12 wins or, but is it pushing, you know, you, you could get on a run and win 15 and build your percentage. It just, you guys didn't have a great percentage this year because you have won so many close games. So yeah, exactly. that all comes, yeah. I think percentage is going to be huge this year. And that's why I have the bigger range and that I'm not, I'm not willing to commit to sort of going, okay, eight to nine or, you know, that because I think there'll be a couple of teams just because of injuries and that'll beat teams by 10, 12 goals. And that's going to be significant come the end of the season. All right, we yeah, should probably move you. on to premiums, boys. Now, I say thank you. premiums thank lightly you, because dude. you don't have a, a single player averaging over 100 Supercoach. So maybe no, no premiums? And, and is, so, is there a premium there on your pre- list? There is. There's three, but they're, they're not really premiums so much as guys that are, I think, Supercoach premiums. But Okay, let's go for that. They would not necessarily <laughs> traditionally be called premiums, if that makes sense. So obviously Tom Mitchell is the first one, um, and I've banged on about Tom Mitchell a lot, so I'll try and keep this one light, but – um, every time I look at Tom Mitchell's stats, I just there's another one that I go, man, how am I not picking Tom Mitchell? Um, yeah, and even like I haven't had, I haven't owned Tom Mitchell for like, I think I owned him for like the back half of two years ago, and then the year before that I didn't have him either because was I think he started at 700k, um, but he's averaged over like 113, 114 for the last outside of last year, like the four years before that, and in all of those years he had over 75% CBAs. So he uh, coming off a year where he had 53% CBAs and he actually increased his clearance rate. So he's, he's the, like compared to the amount of time on ground he had, he had more clearances per game last year than he had the previous, uh, so than the previous two years, yet he had less CBAs. Now I'll put that down a little bit to his injuries that he's obviously been recovering from. And it seems to me like his body's actually back to it. However, touch wood, <laughs> because he's also going into a team mix where they don't play a lot of stoppage football. They try to push the ball forward, et cetera. So they're not looking to lock the ball up as, as often as other teams are. And he was obviously playing for a Hawks team that was a contested brand of football. And then if they lost the ball at contest, they would slingshot it, at, at it back. So, um, I can understand the, the trepidation as, yes, he's coming. He he could definitely be the main CBA midfielder there, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be a super coach gun because of the way that Collingwood play their football. And so I understand the, the, the sort of if factors. And I suppose at the end of the day, you get a discount on price because of that. So all of that taken into consideration still doesn't mean that I don't want to pick him um, based on his previous output and, and previous averages. So. I suppose it's a wait and see on what he can do, but I've consistently been of the opinion that I think his absolute lowest is going to be 105 and his absolute max will probably be around 115, which would pit him as a top 10 midfielder. Uh, Where I probably see him ending is about 110-ish. I think that that is probably five points less of what I think he's he's able to do, but because of the system that he's in. Um, But yeah, Oh, absolutely. So I suppose the, the crux of it is he will come in and, in my opinion, be the number one mid at the Pies. I don't think there's any argument about that. I mean, can you see anyone else being higher CBA numbers than Tom Mitchell next year? No, I can't. He, and he also, averaged, he also averaged 117 in 2021. Um, just having a look at those stats, I think, you know, they're really trying to blood. Uh, Hawks are trying to blood, you know, Newcomb and some of these other guys who got a large time on ground as far as our CBAs. Um, Swizz, here's a little uh, fun trivia for you. Who had more CBA for the year than Dylan Moore? Last year? Yeah. Ooh. That'd be Chad Wingard. Chad Wingard, my friend. Chad Wingard had more CBAs and, and, and the than average Moore. of all those CBAs, mate. Uh, oh, not very well, but, uh, and, and, and what's funny is, is that he, Chad Wingard, I know we're off topic because, um, we can hijack this, but you want, you want me to yeah, Wing, Wingard, now? that's fine. Yeah. Might as well. Wingard actually had quite a few CBAs in the middle of the year and then more pretty much took over by the back end of the year. Mm-hmm. And, um, Wingard had zero. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, sorry, Chris. Yeah, no, uh, that's t- right. Titch is the well, other the one. Other, yeah. One the other thing anyway. with Titch is that he lowered his time on ground 6% last year. That's a large amount of time to not be on the field. So he was at 84% in 2021 and then went down to 78%. Does that go back up? Because he's got the fitness base to be able to do it. I don't think that's an issue. I think that that was literally a, we're trying to play the kids more. 
And if you're thinking of, of like flipping, yeah, if you're thinking of flipping roles as well, so you're talking about at, uh, was it Hawthorne who had maybe 50% time on ground, right? Oh, C- CBA, not time on ground, uh, CBA percentage. Every time he makes um, a handball, I think of the cash money that we're saving. Who who had the number one CBAs at Collingwood last year? Outside of like the Rucks, right? Oh, the midfielders. Who um, had the number one? I'd have and this ties, in, actually, this ties into my comment because I just said, you I said actually, this person's going to be a flip. You were talking about flipping roles. So who did, who's he going to flip with? Well, he's going to say I Jack think it Chris. might be Jack. No, it would be. It probably did. How many games did Dugowie play? Dugowie no. had seventy-seven percent uh, CBAs. Yeah, of the games. I think he he's the one that comes out. So he solves two problems for them. Their, their scoring power went obviously significantly down with Dugowie not in the forward line, and their clearance rate was nowhere near as high. Don't get me wrong. I think Dugowie is one of our better midfielders, if not our best middle fielder, until Mitchell came here. But they can definitely not lose anything by adding Tom Mitchell, but gain a lot by moving Degoe forward. So I do think that there is a role change for Degoe this season. So he's a bit, he's an absolute avoid in my opinion at this at this stage. We'll see. I, I haven't actually heard any training reports about Degoe. So um, uh, he was injured, had that surgery, I think it was, and um, started back training again, start of this year. So there you go. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. But I mean, let's say. Let's say Dugowie doesn't get that, then someone's dropping out, right? And I don't think it's Jack Crisp. Um, I think he still you switches don't? with Dacos. No, I think that him and Dacos will flip um, CBAs. I think Pendles will still get some CBAs. Um, Jamie Elliott had 23% CBAs? of his. Yeah, uh, that, Tyler Brown had 16. Elliott, Elliott had 23. No. Um, Lipinski had 28. Beg had 37. Oh, Lip- I mean, Lipper wasn't really like- even paying much on the ball, was he? Yeah, look, at the end of the day, I think there's definitely, absolutely, Mitchell will come in and just be the number one. And so I'm not sure how the rest of it's going to happen, but I do see more to go forward. I don't see Jack Crisp dropping at all because they still need that real defensive two-way runner. Um, and he really, he and he had speed of that as well. So, yeah, I don't see that happening. Um, so, yeah, I, personally, I, 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 look, he's not a lock. But I can see people cursing themselves for not picking him if you know he drops a one twenty in week one, and then trying yeah. to play catch up and, and how like, do I get him? You guys know I'm a big fan of Tom Mitchell. I've had him those couple of years where I think you guys, well, especially one of them, where you didn't jump on and he was just going ham. Um, and this is where I still had Collingwood in that sort of five to ten range. I know they've lost Grundy, but I feel like is the loss that great going down to Darcy Cameron, where what you've now added with that money. Like Tom Mitchell solves a problem because, as you said, it releases other guys back to probably preferred positions. I think McStay is a better setup than what you've had down there. That's so I think there's just so slight. Yeah, okay, it's a tougher draw, and you've had those close games, but I kind of think the kind would set up that slightly better just for the changes that you've made. And, I just had this also, really think, weird feeling. You think those guys that you brought in last year, like your Lipinski's, it's another year in the system. Um, so I, I'm more, I get more worried about seeing Doug going in the forward line than I do in the midfield as good as a midfielder he is because one-on-one in that forward line, you know, you, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on the, on Backman and like, you, you don't want to be lining up next to him when the ball spills on the ground. I just I had this Colin, really weird come, feeling boys, like, yeah. You know how I occasionally get this deja vu feeling and I'm not one of those people that gets deja vu. I can barely even remember a single dream in my life. Right. But yeah. I honestly, just as we were talking, I was just like, I had this dream that you guys started somebody that I didn't, and he just went on an absolute heater, and it, and it was Titch. It, it, it was actually Titch. And is it, it is every possibility he finds his, his way into my team by round one because oh. I'd, um, you know, I'm gonna hashtag I, he's bless been him. my love child for the last couple of years. I, it's one of those things like, you know, when you do really well one year, and I got burnt that one time when – I. Like Matt Crouch and Rory Sloan like led me to nearly like top hundred or whatever it was, and then the next year I picked them and then they both went down injured early. But yeah, you just there's some players you just love, and as much as he handballs too much for my liking, I still I do have a soft spot for Tommy Mitch. So yeah, but he's got you know. he's got Nick Dacos to handball to now, so it's fine. Well, that's it. He's actually got players in that. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and that's what as I said. You look a better team. Like as Chris Pendles goes back to half back, that only improves you. Like it doesn't make you worse. So. I think oh, I can't believe I'm going to hashtag that, bless him, Chris. I'm blessing him. Hashtag bless. I can't believe it. Here's the can't thing with Titch it. that might even people change need to be now, aware of as well. What's, what's Titch's ownership percentage right now? No, Too high. I actually because it, yeah, I, guarantee, I think it's big. 
no fucking big. Um, it's uh, where are we here? Um, it, I don't know. Oh, well, there it is. Twenty twenty seven percent is the twenty six most owned player. Okay, right now. So that's Which pretty is, big, but I can see it just going up and up and up, right? And so it, I think it's going to be a little bit like Paddy Cripps of last year. Yeah, I know Cripps was seventy k cheaper, and I get that. But I mean, the same thing is that people that didn't pick him, they just started well behind the eight ball, and well, we all talk that could happen this year with Titch. We all talk LDU versus Tom Green. I know we were talking about on the Jock Reynolds one the other day, but it's yep. LDU Tom Green versus Tom Mitchell at that same price. So if you're looking for that guy around that five twenty five thirty mark, the difference is Mitchell's got the proven scoring ability. Where we're hoping LDU and Green take that next step. They you know, yeah, most likely proven, will, but yeah. yeah. So scenario, right? Let's say uh, you start the season, you've got Took Miller and Took bangs out 105, 110, first two rounds, and Titch goes 125, 130. Are you trading Took to Titch in round three? <sighs> like, How much do you make? You about know, 150, you know, yeah, don't you? Thing. you make about 150,000? The, the money, yeah, the money probably makes me want to do it because that 150K potentially makes you know so it, it helps me either get up to one of those mid prices that I either missed or it say it's yo or five doesn't work out it brings one of them up to like maybe a premium get, or get, semi premium or something like that that yeah that I've kind of fucked up so I think it depends potential. if you if you can do something with that 150 to fix something else and get another player that looks like they're a must have then I don't mind so much otherwise I'm more of a, a stickler for just you know just stick it Hope Titch just falls well, off see, a cliff, I, and then I you... mean, this is more of a structure talk than a Collingwood talk. But oh. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm very much part of the fuck it this year because we got 36 trades and trade boosts. Like, I, why wouldn't I do it? Is like can, okay. Can the I the old, well, I'll go first, Benny, on this one. The old gamble responsibly, but two rounds after that, Tom Mitchell for Anzac Day medal this year. Um, oh. On the. <laughs> Hands up, Dan Metal. Um, to, to counter yours, Chris. So sometimes I'm like, no, no, don't burn that trade. But I also did that for about six rounds on Whitfield and waited and then had to trade him because he was horrible and got injured. I did the same thing with Josh Kelly, except I traded him and then he became a permanent midfielder. Lovely. <laughs> and I also said the exact same thing with Aaron Hall. I'm like, don't get Aaron Hall. And next minute, he's like, obviously killed it. And I said the same thing with Sinclair. Not that I didn't like Sinclair, it didn't fit my wife's structure. So I was literally like, don't get Sinclair, don't get Sinclair. And it was a horrible decision. It looked so good in my team last year. So good. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Top. Se- I'm just saying. Top like, seventy. Yeah, so the so... Whole, I think the thing that I um the thing that I just wanted to point out of that was that the whole don't trade your premiums thing is kind of out the window in my opinion now. Like it's it's not don't trade your premiums. It's trade the right premiums. You know, yeah, that's if right. you've got if you've got the the opportunity to make a move, take it early in the season when you can maximize points for the rest of the season. So mm. anyway, just thought I yeah I think that he will be a lot higher towards the season. All right, now moving on. Um, Nick Dacos is the other one. So obviously a lot of people are considering Nick Dacos, um, 502K. I had him in my team for a few weeks there. Um, I still like him as an option. He's one of the better prices. The the, the biggest problem with the defensive structures right now is you've got five guys that are 600K and then basically not many, maybe Brayshaw in the middle of that. And then you've got two guys at 500K that are pretty good in Himmelberg and, and Dacos. And then you got a few mid prices, right? So, um, most of those guys at the, at, uh, at that sort of uh, sorry six hundred k price tag, they all sort of averaged. Me. Sorry, mate. They all sort of averaged one hundred and ten. Um, you know, so we're what that's what we're looking for. So that the mark is going to be around about one hundred and ten average for a premium defender this year. Is that sort of an accurate statement you'd say, or one hundred five to one ten minimum? I'd say a hundred plus. I'm still happy with. I think 110 is pretty ridiculous. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's an. an yeah, well, I'm not sure if it's case, an anomaly. You must be banking on those guys to drop off. Well, some of them, of them did like, it last Sinclair, year. like Sinclair, like <laughs> um, Sinclair. Yeah, <laughs> so look, I think it'll be now. interesting. Yeah, so well, four, Hilberg uh, went 110 as a defender. Yeah, he did. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. So I, I just feel like that 110 mark is that is the, is the mark now. Which means that the defenders have raised there. So, so that my my thing against. I don't Dacos, think it's hundred. I think it. I think you're somewhere in the middle. I think it's maybe it's like like one six, one oh seven, but sp- yeah. splitting hairs here. But yeah, I think Dacos could do it. And the reason is he had a nine game stretch of one twelve, where he was just led to just do whatever he wants. 
But like we've been pointed out many times on Twitter by a whole bunch of people, he also is susceptible to the tag. So what we know, though, is that early in the season, he's going to get that free license again. They're going to just not do anything with him, and then it'll take a few games until they go, okay, maybe we should nail down on Nick Dacos. And that could be a thing that could impact his scoring. So he's susceptible to that. Um, but he'll just he does work Actually, really hard. I don't, I don't mind teams tag. watching, though. My, I don't my, mind teams just watching and actually seeing how teams play. Because if you throw a tag mm-hmm. straight on somebody to begin with, right, you don't really – it might work, right? But if you actually get that sort of a little bit of data, see what teams are running, see who they're preferring to kind of – who's doing the most damage in their new setup for the season, then you go and ruin the party. Um, so I don't mind that. And nice of you to get rid of those last two rounds out of Dacos' score there, Chris. But I won't argue because I got rid of him after round 11, and then that's when he went on the 11-round bender of 104.6. Hmm, same. So – yeah, like a lot of people, I was like, "Oh, wonderful!" He was, My, he was I, tagged I in those last games, which is why, which is why I brought that up. So, yeah, check that, yourself before you wreck that's yourself. Buddy. Thing, yeah. What's got you? Oh, you? Excuse me, right? you said nine round. Yeah, you went you went one twelve over nine rounds. I'm like, okay, but then one hundred four point six over I the last eleven. We talk about that round six bombers, maybe a chance Anzac Day, but I think round seven, the Suns. That's when you start looking at your tag. There, they're not tagging. Yep. Tommy Mitchell doesn't get tagged. Pendles isn't getting tagged. So what are your options there? It's Chris is not getting tagged. So it's either Taylor Adams no. or, or Dacos and that, and that's where it's at. So, and I think if Dacos, especially if he does have a massive game against West Coast or on Anzac Day, if he was to put himself in the voting for Anzac medal, watch it, he'll get absolutely locked down two of the next three games. And I say two of the next three because Richmond don't tag. So, um, yeah, but he's a, it's a big chance. But as you said, you'll have those first six weeks, he'll run around and do whatever he wants. Yeah. So but here's my thing as well, like with that. Okay. So in that first six weeks, does he make a hundred grand? Probably. Maybe. So then he's in four. You, you could no, have the opportunity highest, to be like. He's the, he's the 10th highest pick player right now. Oh, wow. So it's oh, 45%. I kind of, I kind of want to rather pass. I kind of want to bet pass. on it. If it was like, you know, 25%, I'm probably on. 45 percent i'm like it's so much and it could even go higher by the start of the season no wow. doubt it that's crazy I think but he, look he, as i said like, 50, there's reasons for it yeah and look i mean he what he's he's going to be 19, 19 years old he's i think we've all seen he's an absolute jet right so there's no question about his ability or his super coach ability um can he do it yeah is it likely for him to do it i don't know um is where i'm at I think at very least he's so not I'll going tell you, down. I'll tell you the, so it's not like I, I nearly think sorry. if I want to keep my structure in my team, is it a case of it's just Himmelberg versus him? And I think that's probably on a few people's mind. Going, I want that guy at that price. If Himmelberg lines up, looks like round, lining up round one in defence, it's an easy pick for him. If not, then it's probably the switch to Dacos because then you're not stuffing around with your structure. See, I like yeah, Dacos, but I'm looking at betting, betting against him. I'm betting against him at those odds. Those oh, many dude, people on there, he gets tagged or has a little bit of a quiet streak. You know I mean, he's that damaging that he probably needs to spend a year or so of getting attention, and then it'll be like Gary Ablett. He gets, just mm. gets attention all the time. But what I do like is that Question, he, as though, a first-year if, player... If Dacos oh, wait, wait, wait. was wearing maroon, blue, and gold, would you have him? No, it's the same thing. Right? <laughs> otherwise, I'd have Rainer, otherwise, I'd have Rainer in my forward line playing me you know, back playing. Um <laughs> <laughs> but what I will say for a first year player, it's not many times you see a first year player have four scores over 125 mm-hmm. and have that ceiling. So that's where I am interested. I'm kind of watching and seeing, but with too many people on him, I think it's probably better interest for me to avoid. Yeah. Even yeah, 10, the other one, 15% um, lower, I'm more interested. Yeah. Look, at the end of the day as well, um, what we have seen so far in the match sim is that his role hasn't really changed too much. I was a bit worried that he'd have way more way more midfield time. Like they basically go, no, you're mid forward now, not a defender mid. And that's not the case. He's actually predominantly playing still half back and then pushing into midfield. So um, I think that splits probably still somewhere between 60 to 70% defense, um, which is good because he'll still get kickouts and still get some cheap possessions, et cetera. Um, and they, they actually give him, gave him kickouts last year to free him up from tags. So like, oh, you're not getting the ball much. Just go down and take some kickouts. Okay. I'll get some free fuzzies. <laughs> And some yeah. free super coach points. Um, so look, yeah, I'm I'm sort of torn on it. Um, I'm I'm like you, Swiss. I think the same thing. It's either going to be Himmelberg or Dacos. I'm not probably not going to run both. 
at this stage, I've got Himmelberg, but that doesn't mean that I won't have Dacos come round one and I'd, I'm flipping all the time. So, um, I think that's yeah, maybe that's the last the moment. Uh, it's, it, it's the two primos and then Himmelberg Dacos, or some are going just the one primo and then it's Himmelberg Dacos, or something in that range, like those who like Redmond or McGrath or whatever. But yeah, mainly those yeah. two. Um, I'm assuming is your last one a ruck there, Chris? Ruck forward, possibly Better for your last me. premium? It is, yes. Yep. Good. Okay, so can I just quickly say then, if we are disregarding, so I know in 2021, right, crisp average 104.9. Are we saying that now because of Dacos coming into that side and being so dominant in that role and through the midfield, that Dacos is now no longer a premium option to watch for in standard? You mean crisp? Oh, you mean crisp? Crisp. Sorry, crisp. No, yeah, he had I, a, he had I a, mean, crisp 10 point as a mid only is not a... At crisp as a mid only is not a premium option. Crisp is one of those guys that if he goes back to defence, then I'm not, I'll watch. If he gets back and, and sits around half back, and that, he, he I'll could get um, he he could position. play enough to, in defence. He, he's the one that when that they are, when they asked yeah. me the other day on the sorry, Chris, I didn't mean to talk over you. When on, they asked me on okay. the other day on the other podcast, I shouldn't mention that because I'm wearing my don't plug other podcast shirt. But I said, yeah, they were talking to me about. Um, who's likely to pick up your position? And my one and two is either Pendle or Crisp. I feel like one of them's picking it up in round six because one of them's making the move. Yeah, yeah I'll be keen to watch some of the uh, intra clubs and some of the preseason games to see who I might actually jump on a little bit and draft. It's always a risk in draft because I know last year they were talking about McGrath, Andy McGrath getting a defensive status. I actually picked him up closer towards a hundred average defensive line and just didn't work out for me. So it is a risk reward system sometimes you go hey this person's probably getting dpp so you jump early and all of a sudden it's like oh any mcgraw midfield only averaging like 80 and it sucked like it was <laughs> so bad i could have got so many more better players in draft that weren't averaging me 80 in the midfield um so just a heads up as far as that risk reward system if they're free and it's late then go for it sorry chris last primo, primo. yeah but last one's obviously darcy cameron um i think that was pretty obvious um in terms of the Premium options. So there are premiums. They're just sort of underpriced premiums is what I like to call them. And we all saw it last year. So Grundy goes down with an injury. Darcy Cameron averaged 97 from that point on. And in fact, when playing Ruck as in the, as a position, he averaged 104. Um, so there were games where uh, Cox was preferred as the main Ruck and then Darcy Cameron played forward in those games. Um, when he played forward, he only averaged 70. So big disparity between him playing forward and Ruck. And for that reason, obviously, you need to make sure that Darcy Cameron is playing Ruck to be able to do that. Uh, but like I said in the in this OP, <laughs> original post, um, essentially at the end of the day, I do think that Cameron is a number one. I don't think there is any question about that. And I think if you'd ask any level-headed Pi supporter, they'd also say the same thing. The other thing working in his favour was that Cox only averaged, I think, between 50 to 55% time on ground last year. Um, in fact, you, we probably have that on the actual spreadsheet there, mate. Um, but his time on ground was ridiculously low. Some games he'd only play 30, 40% time on ground. Um, so I think that, that what the situation would be is that 64.3 for the whole year. Yep. Yep. So I think what the, what the, um, what will happen during this season is at three quarter time, the one that's going to get subbed if there's you know no other injuries or issues is going to be a Cox. And I think that's a no brainer substitute if you ask me. So um, the other benefit, though, is if Gardner, if they stay with Gardner as that option and don't play Cox, and you know, then you'd imagine that um, Cameron would get even uh, more ruck time. So McStay, who do I say? Cameron. Gardner. Man, I'm all over the shop. Gardner. You really want oh, to Gardner. Trade Gardner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, Gardner for sure. No McStay. Same thing, mate. They look the same, same different same. ends of the same, field. Same, same, same. Yeah, okay, right. So yeah, McStay. Um, yeah. So the the other thing is, yeah, they could go. Okay, the two rucks isn't working early, and they go. Okay, we're just going to go with McStay as the as that tall. And Ash Johnson is the third third tall, um, which is preferable. I, I, that's personally how I want to line up. I want McStay as the relief ruckman that also is the second target in the forward line. But I can see that Cox obviously offers something completely different to what those guys add. So there's a potential that Cox is still named. But I'm not scared of the fact that just because Cox and Cameron are named on the same side, that that's going to impact Cameron too negatively, not want me to pick him. I still think he's going to be a very, very valuable uh, forward um, that can obviously offer offer cover in the ruck. And in my opinion, he's going to be the best averaging ruck forward as well. Um, I think is Meek also ruck forward? And is that the other one that everyone's pretty much on? Meek. Yeah, I've heard someone. 
I was just too yeah, busy so thinking that you heard it here first. Uh, Chris isn't scared of cocks. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that is, that is that is brutal, but also true. It was your, it was your, your, your words. Um, Mickey, what are your yeah. thoughts on uh, on Cameron Boys? Oh, I'm split. I, yeah, suppose. I don't know about you. I've, I've had him in my team heaps, but when, when going through his stats as well, it was kind of like he gets 100 every second week. So it was, you know, uh, eight tons out of 16 games. Obviously, he did play a couple forwards, so then probably it's, you know, what, eight out of 14. Um, yeah, I mean, it's – I like the coverage, but at the same time, I'm like, do you win with coverage? Yes, you might if you have an injury and it covers you really well. If you don't have any injuries and you're kind of relying on him to compete against a Taranto or a DPP player coming in, um, then I get a bit worried. But again, as you said, there's plenty of trades. If he doesn't work out, I can always flip him for someone who is doing well. He still probably makes cash. I think he's at a really good price point. So I think it's probably a safe option, especially if I have you know English and Marshall in my ruck line. If I just go with one, it has to be Cameron uh, you know, as my uh, R2. So it's so whiz. Mate, I haven't. I've had him in my team the entire time. Currently sitting in R two. It's just a question if he gets bumped to sort of F three to start the season, or it's R two. But I'm going in the season with him unless he gets injured. He's F five is where it's at, guys. That's where you need to have him. <laughs> that's not where you have him, right? <laughs> like, that's Chris little, likes it deep. No, that's that's a little teaser to the new the new uh, oh, uh, no. team that I dropped today, boys. That you obviously haven't F- paid any attention to. Well, you release one every week. F five. <laughs> Hang on. So was that McLe- is that McLean is that McLean F six? Is what you're saying? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And how and how many uh, premiums do you have? Not many, by sounds of it. In the in the whole team or in the forward line? No, the, the whole team. I imagine the forward line. Twelve. Stack. Right. Twelve draft premiums. Now you're like intrigued. Me. He wants to go off and have a look. Interesting. My, it's just in case you're. Wondering, no, I'm saying draft. I'm saying draft premiums. Thing. I'm saying draft premiums because it doesn't sound like they are going to be top six to eight in their position. But anyway, um, what have we got next? Are you looking at rookies or breakouts? Or yes, draft? no. So uh, a little bit of a breakout. I'll only mention this a little bit. I went through their list and I couldn't find anyone that I'm like, oh, they're looking to break out, role changes or anything like that. Um, I just think there is a little bit more progression in um, Isaac Quainer. He's come back super, super fit. Um, I love his rebound off half back. The only problem is obviously his role. He doesn't really get freed up a lot. He's obviously um, plays a lot of lockdown small um, defender. So, uh, but if he does get free, he's going to unleash. The kid is an absolute jet. He's been winning a lot of our time trials. He's got a six pack for days. Um, so yeah, one to watch, but I'm not exactly 100% confident. It, there's, there's really just a natural progression there. Nothing super coach or role related that I can uh, write home about, unfortunately. Um, now, rookies, so a bit of conjecture, of obviously. So we've obviously discussed this quite a lot, but conjecture about how the entire 22 really line up, and there's a, a huge amount of off-season player movement. Um, there's a three-way battle currently for the one position in defense. So there is one available fullback role. So Murphy was thrown into fullback when Jordan Roughhead retired. Um, we had a lot of injuries. Charlie Dean was actually um, come on, came on board, and he was going to play that role for us. Um, but then he got injured and went down and then on his comeback, he also then got injured again. And so they just left Murphy there, but he's not tall enough to play as a key post. And so that's one of the deficiencies there is that, that we obviously went and got Billy Frampton um, as a, another key defender. So we've now got, um, it's a three-way battle really for that one spot. It's going to be the Frampton, Charlie Dean, who's 123K defender um, or Murphy. And there's no real way of knowing until the, the day that the team sheets come out. But that is reportedly what's happening. And, and it's actually currently more towards Dean and Frampton rather than Murphy. So Murphy seems to be on the outer with the team, at least in a 22. Might make a 23 or 25-ish and first injury down. Uh, but that seems to be the way. Uh, Bobby Hill is actually 221K. He's rumored to be uh, playing high half forward and wing. However, I'm not sure that there's a spot available in the 22. And he could potentially be a sub risk. I feel like he's one of those guys that they'd probably want as the sub to add that extra run up the wing into the half forward line, but can also finish in the forward line. Um, so one to watch, but risky and at his price, I'm not really super, super hot on. 
Um, and if he's also the sub, then you've got, you know, plenty of players that can go through that midfield. So say a midfielder gets injured, it's like, oh, well, you know, to go with your side bottom, you go into the midfield and, and he'll, you're now in that forward line and be really dynamic there as yeah. well. So I think it probably covers quite a lot of area. Um, so Reef McInnes, 176K forward, is reportedly um, – so he's been playing as a third tall hit-up forward, uh, which is really Ash Johnson's role right now in the team that obviously came in late last year and had a big impact. But apparently Ash Johnson came back from um, the offseason really underdone. So Reef McInnes has been absolutely flying, playing as a third tall, and he could be one to be named in round one. So just keep an eye on that. Um, as I said, 176K forward. Um, that's that would only be the case if they wanted a you know, McStay as the second stay at home tall and um and if you know no Mason Cox. The other one that comes into question that if there's no Mason Cox is Aiden Begg, who's the ruck forward backup um at the Pies. He's 187k forward ruck. Played a couple of games last year, had some good moments and some good sc- I think on the first game he had an 81. Um, but then followed up with some really average scores and then was dropped and then went back in the seconds. He's come back in absolute blistering form as well. So there's that guy. Um, Ed Allen, 126K mid. Um, he's apparently slotted straight in. He's a tall uh, mobile midfielder with uh, good use on both feet, um, can rack the pill up, but also he's more more of an outside than he is inside, but he can also play inside if they called upon. Um, so he'd be a great super coach selection. Not sure he's in the round one team, but he's close to it, according to David King, who watched um, their training last week, I think it was. He said yeah, he absolutely was. The so, second half of the year. Yeah, huge big bolter. bolter. Um, could be one to watch. Finn McRae, I was hot on, but he's actually had a back stress issue. Um, and that happened just before Christmas. He's only just started running again. So I wouldn't imagine that he'd be have enough of a full preseason to be selected for round one. So those that were looking at Finn McRae, and I know there's a lot of them, I'd probably sign him out um, until we get more information. The one that has uh, flown through this week was um, Joe Richards. So Steel Sidebottom actually put the notice out saying Joe Richards is absolutely flying and adding a lot to their forward line and blah, blah, blah. Um, not exactly 22 sure. 22 years old too. Yeah. 22 I, I year old mature recruit. Yeah. Mature age recruit. Basically, what happened with him is he came out of um, the Wangaratta country footy system. Uh, ben Reed's the coach, um, former Collingwood um, All Australian centre back, and prem- is he a Premiership player? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, anyway, so he he was the co- their coach, and he said, "Oh, you got to come out and watch this kid. He's absolutely amazing." Blah blah blah. Um, and he, uh, our recruiter, went out there six on six different occasions to watch him play, and every single game, he just completely tore it up. And he they came to the grand final. I think he kicked like four goals in the game and had, you know, 30 touches or something stupid. And uh, Derek Hine walked away and, yeah, we're, we're going to draft him. So, um, yeah, look, he's uh, he's obviously come in and, and made a really big impact. But I'm not sure if he's the 22nd or, or player or in the best 22. I think he's probably 23. So in that sort of situation, do you really want a guy that has a sub risk on your – even if it's on your pine? I don't – I don't know where I sit. I think there's enough rookies that you probably don't have to make that decision. Um, but ultimately, we're, we're probably not going to know much until that first practice game because there is so much, move, so many moving parts because there's so much off-season movement that we can't be sure exactly how they're going to line up that round one. So keep an eye on a lot of them. But yeah, I, I can't say one's like an absolute guaranteed starter. Subs are going to kill cash generation. Ugh. Facts. I'm, I'm moving to my team is moving towards having less subs that are going to because of the sub rule risk. So oh, sorry, yep. I said less sub, less rookies because of the sub less rookies. Yep. Yeah, less less unless, on unless field they rookies look, anyway. Unless the, all the talk has been about them being embedded in their best twenty-two, and it looks like the role is theirs, I am on in the belief of taking like caution first, and I'm looking. Yeah, if it's a toss-up between two people, I'm like I'll take a slower cash burn for someone who's going to play every week then someone will go a sub and get a 20 or a 30 and just kill. Because we've seen it even before, um, yep. like McDonald or whatever from a Hawthorne or uh, Ward, if they just ha- even if they just had a bad game, let alone being sub, the cash just stops. And all of a sudden you've got a guy who's like 180 to 220,000 maybe max, and they're just stopped. They just stop earning you money. And then even then, oh, maybe they go back in their best 22, but now you've got to wait three more weeks for it to be out of their cycle. So not only is it going to stop their cash, it's also going to be a pain in the ass if you keep them. Because mm-hmm. now you have to, once they get back to be best 22, 
then you have to wait three more weeks for that to be out of their cycle and then you start making real money it's just yeah fraught with danger yeah yeah that's why i like it i, I don't even mind a ben king for example like people just are just shredding amazing, that yeah. pick and i'm like i couldn't care less i i think gold coast improve i think he's an absolute jet and is a proven goal kicker and a best and a buy like best best 10 player at that club probably higher so yeah i know he's a risk to drop low scores but he's not a sub risk he's not no. not going to play every week if he's fit you know what i mean like yeah, there's worse things available this year. I think that the sub rule has really thrown a massive spanner in the mix, and we just got to be aware of it when we when we do anything. Um, so draft smokies, last the last thing to finish off with. We have already touched on these guys. So I, as it's mentioned here, um, so Crisp obviously a chance of gaining defender status is interesting. So if he does look like he's going to be a defender, it might be a great little um, round six target. He could you could think of. And similar to be said for Dugowie. So Dugowie might be worth gaining if he gets that 35% forward threshold, which I think is absolute guaranteed. But um, depending on what that mix mix is, where he he might still get, say, 30 40% CBAs and, and be playing forward and averaging quite well. So um, it'll be interesting to see, but just one to watch. Nothing that I would say. In a draft, you see, you can take those guys because I think people will be either right off Dugowie and he'll slide out of the equation or they'll be really hot on him and go super early, and you'll be like, "What are you? What are you doing?" <laughs> yeah, um, especially so if you get to the point where forwards, to... especially if forwards get real thin, too, because yes. you start to look at like, "Oh, like I need a forward," and then there's a guy here, and you're looking at who's on that list, and you're like, "I don't really like any of them." And then if you go, "Hey, well, to go is actually better than all of those picks that are next on my list," that's the point where you're probably worth taking the risk. Um, the other one I'm looking at as well is just for you know a bit of a buffer. I mean, he only averaged 80.3, but Taylor Adams apparently is um, sharp and fit and unhampered by the groin issue we had last year. So I'll I know Titch coming in, it then. might actually hmm. – oh, yeah, I know that. But as in as far as value goes, I mean, there's a 15-point increase based on what he did the year before that. He yeah. is someone that if he does have a good run, he won't have the attention. He can just go about his business and he could go 95 towards 100. Um if everything goes well. So, look, I think there's definitely value there. We average 80. No one's going to be picking him up. Taylor Adams, as one of your last midfielders, I think you could do a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, he's also a sub risk though, right? <laughs> <laughs> if he gets no, injured. No, oh. no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Look, I love Taylor Adams, but the amount of times that he's gone down injured in-game as well, I'm just, dude, how many times you got to have a, a groin strain before you realize your groins are done and you probably should retire, like, how he's not even that old, man. Like, how old's Taylor Adams? Surely he's not 20, 29. 29, yeah. yeah, he's not that old at all. Um, interesting, yeah, yeah, interesting. I mean, what does he play one full season? If that is that about right, yeah, when not he was many. playing halfback and he played brilliant, yep. like get him back to the halfback line. <laughs> Can't pull a hammy when he's not tackling people. Uh, <laughs> anyway, all good. Um, but yeah, I think that pretty much wraps me up for everything. You guys have anything else you want to touch on or? Yeah, the the only one like I kind of like just the draft watch out. I really like John Noble. I um I think he's quite underrated. He slides so he, under under the radar, doesn't he? Yeah, he does slide. He's that one of those guys that you can probably pick up late unless you've got like a whole lot of Collingwood supporters in your um in your draft. And yeah, he had a couple of low scores last year. I can't remember if they were injury affected or whatever, but still averaged seventy four. So I think he he's somebody who could push an eighty and that. And there's a bit of a smoky there as you. D4, D5, depending on how deep you guys are. And that, that's, um, yeah, I don't mind him. Where do you sit on I, Maynard? He he averaged 10 points less this year than he did, or 2022 than he did 2021. Um, as far as draft, would you be, is it, yeah, yeah, but is, do you I, think I there's. Think Noble more probably gets the ball there than what um, what Maynard does. Maynard was playing that more accountable role. So he holds that probably low 80 average for draft and not really value? The thing, that, well, I mean, you don't really know because what ended up happening was that Maynard was taking a lot of taller guys last year because they were undersized. So when that happened, like he's not really a, a tall defender, but I remember it wasn't maybe not last year, but the year before he was even playing on Buddy. And we were like, what are, mm. what are you? I know you're competitive, man, but you, you, were undersized you don't have a chance. That was injuries. Yeah. 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 So – that, that, that's been our, our last year. Yes, our defense held up. No idea how. Man, probably because we had a fit Darcy Moore for the first time in our entire existence. But yeah, no, we the fact that we didn't have a second tall, every every week I went into a contest being like, we're going to get killed. We're going to get killed. We're going to get killed. 
And then, like, you know, against Carlton, of course, Charlie Kernow just breaks out and kicks, you know, five, six goals. We just get killed by the bigs because we just don't have the the size to match mm. up on them. So, yeah, it's just an, it just Shout out to so, Darcy. Darcy Moore as well, apparently captain. Probably be named this week, I hear. Yeah, I, like, I, th- I think it was probably likely from the get-go. Um, not wouldn't it wouldn't have been my pick, but yeah, um, he's he's definitely good. He's on light duty too, uh, building up slowly yeah, yeah, from the middle of Jan. Currently, but he said he's he said he's playing round one. So oh yeah, don't think it's going to be. Not an sure issue. how how good he'll be though. Uh, all right, that wraps us up. Uh, can only go uphill from here. So I think uh, what is it? Essendon. Oh, Excellent. actually, no, it can't it can't go uphill from here. Uh, <laughs> although we'll. The Will Setterfield Show, I think, is what we'll pretty much name it. Um, that is it from us next time. Let us know who you like, who you're listening to, and what you are looking forward to this season, particularly if you're playing draft. Hit us up as well. Uh, and once we finish this series, the spreadsheet that we are using every year for all drafts, etc., will be yours, available, exclusive, uh, as long as Jock Reynolds are okay with uh, us uploading that as well at the same time. So we'll convene and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Bye.